Amen. Praise, I like that. Praise the Lord. Thank you, choir. What a blessing it is to be in the Lord's house this morning. And what the choir just sang goes perfectly well with this passage of Scripture that we're going to be looking at this morning. Uh, let the church arise, and we do that by love. Loving the world. Loving those who hate us. Uh, we do that by loving them. Not by burning their books or anything such as that. Open your Bible, Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to be looking at verses 43 through 48. Matthew chapter 5. 43 through 48, my beautiful bride read this passage earlier in our service, so let's have a word of prayer together. Our Father, we come before you now in the glorious name of Jesus Christ. And we come in the mighty power of your Holy Spirit. And we are grateful for your presence perfect word. We ask your blessings upon the reading of it, the preaching of it, and the hearing of it, and we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Peter Miller was a preacher in Ephrata, Pennsylvania, during the Revolutionary War. Everyone loved Peter Miller, except one man. His name was Michael Whitman. Michael Whitman hated Peter Miller, and he hated the church that Peter Miller pastored. In fact, he did many terrible things to Peter Miller. He beat him on one occasion. He spat in his face. And then to put salt in a wound beyond that, he was a friend to the British in the midst of the Revolutionary War. Well, one day, Michael Whitman was caught spying for the British. And he was sentenced to be hanged. Peter Miller heard of Michael Whitman's crime, his impending execution, and he began walking to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, where the execution was to take place. By now, he was old and gray-headed and tired, yet he walked 60 miles to see his old friend, George Washington. When he arrived, he asked General Washington to grant a pardon for Michael Whitman. George Washington said, I'm sorry, Peter, but I can't do that. I can't grant a pardon for your friend that's a spy. At that, Peter Miller said, friend, he's no friend. He hates me more than any man alive. Washington said, well, why would you walk 60 miles to ask me for the pardon of a man who hates you? And Peter Miller answered, I ask because Jesus Christ did the same for me. George Washington granted that pardon. And Peter Miller took Michael Whitman back to Ephrata, no longer an enemy, but a friend. It's easy to love those who love us. But I don't know about you, but for me, it's hard. 
to love those who hate us. This passage marks the final example of how Jesus Christ has authority over the law. And he calls his followers to love those who hate them. He's calling us to allow him to love the unlovable through us. So how do you do that? How do you love your enemy? Well, we're going to look at three things in this passage that can help us better understand what Jesus meant by loving our enemies. First of all, we have to understand that love is a choice. Love it's a choice. Look at verses 43 through 45. Let's look at these verses carefully. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you or persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his Son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Maybe you're different from me, but sometimes I just have a hard time loving those folks who absolutely hate me, and I don't know, I can't think of any enemy. I'm thinking in broad terms of, uh, I'm sure, um, Mr. Um, Osama uh, bin Laden, I'm sure he hates me. I'm sure if he had a chance, he would kill me simply because I'm an American. And it's not easy to, to love that fellow. But Jesus said, Jesus said, the kind of love that he's talking about here is not a matter of emotion, but a matter of the will, a matter of choice. The first part of what Jesus said is a partial quote from Deuteronomy 19, verse 18. You shall love your neighbor. But here's what's interesting. The last part of what Jesus said hate your enemy, guess what? That's not found anywhere in the law. In fact, it's almost not found anywhere in the Bible. The closest thing to it is in the Psalms. And Jesus is confronting the Pharisees in this sermon in chapter 5, and when he does that, he confronts them with the law, so he's talking about the first five books of the Bible, not about the Psalms. So it's very doubtful he's referring to Psalm 139 here. It's very doubtful that he has Psalm 139 in, the, in mind, which, by the way, says, beginning in verse 21, Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. That's as close as you get in the Bible to hate your enemy. But Jesus calls us to love our enemy. Look what he said. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. What Jesus said right there is the key to Christianity. That's what makes us different. That's why we're not a religion. But we have a relationship with God. Through Jesus Christ, His one and only Son. This is the key to Christianity. Because it's, it's absolutely 
counter human. We don't like, much less love those who curse us, hate us, use us, and persecute us. Loving folks who hate us is not typical human behavior. That's godly behavior. St. Augustine said, listen, this is worth writing down. This is an awesome quote. St. Augustine said, to love those who love you is human. To hate those who hate you is demonic. To love those who hate you is divine. That's what Jesus is saying. To love those who love you is human. To hate those who hate you is demonic. But to love those who hate you, well, that's divine. And all of the things that Jesus said here in verse 44, these are things that only God can do. And our role in that is stewardship. We allow God to love through us. And when we do that, we reflect his character. We allow him to produce his fruit through us. When we allow him to love through us. And then Jesus gave us verse 45 as a demonstration as an example of how God does this. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven, listen, for he makes his Son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Jesus is saying, God doesn't discriminate. There are many people on earth that hate God, that are enemies of God. Paul said we were before we were saved. <laughs> Jesus said there are many on the earth who are enemies of God, who hate God. Yet he doesn't discriminate. He loves them anyway. He treats us all the same. He sends us his rain and his sunshine. He does not discriminate and neither should we. Well, let's move on. Secondly, love the unlovely. Verses 46 and 47. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Jesus used the perfect analogy of his day in these two verses. And he used this title two times. The tax collector. The tax collector embodied everything we do not want in a friend. They were swindlers, they were cheaters, they were robbers, they had no mercy. And to make matters worse, they had the full power of the Roman Empire behind them. The Jews hated them. The Pharisees wanted nothing to do with them. I mean, tax collectors at the time of Jesus were like the scum of the earth. There's probably some versions that use that. Because that's what Jesus was saying. That's what he meant. He knew exactly what he was doing. Matthew certainly understood how tax collectors were viewed in society. He was one of them. Matthew, the author of this gospel, was a tax collector. Isn't it interesting he was also one of the apostles? Isn't it interesting he was also one of the two apostles? who were given the privilege to write Gospels? Isn't that interesting? Matthew understood the tax collector. 
He understood the hatred that many Jewish people had for him. But he also understood the incredible, amazing grace that Jesus Christ had provided for him. Jesus said, if you love only the people who love you, then you're, better, then you're no better off than a tax collector. If you love only the people who love you, then you're no better off than the scum of the earth. <laughs> if you speak only, the, only to the people who speak to you, then you're no better off than the scum of the earth. That's what he was saying. You see, we don't have to be a follower of Jesus Christ to be nice to people who are nice to us. We don't have to be a follower of Jesus Christ to love those who love us. But to love your enemies, bless those who curse us, do good to those who hate us, pray for those who spitefully use us and persecute us. Folks, you got to be like Jesus to do that. You got to be like Jesus to do that. It's easy, it's easy to greet someone in Sunday school or in worship that we know, we already have a relationship with, that we, we already like. It's easy to reach out to someone that we like. But to be like Jesus, we have to reach out to people that we don't even love. We have to love people that are mean to us. In short, we would say in, in our language today, Christ is calling us to walk the high road. That's what he's doing. He's calling us to walk the high road. And he knew that's not easy. And I know that's not easy, and you know that's not easy. But you know what? The easy part, that doesn't matter. It's right. That's what matters. Jesus never said following him would be easy. Just right. So that what we, that, that's what we do. This cross is covered up with envelopes. Many of them. For people that we don't know. Some of them may not even like us, <laughs> but that's okay, because it's the right thing to do, to love them and to reach out to them. Well, let's move on to mature love. Matthew 5, 48, one of these difficult verses, therefore you shall be perfect. Just as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's one of those difficult verses in the Bible. But there are three keys that we're going to look at that unlocks the mystery of this verse. First of all, the word for perfect here, it doesn't mean sinless, it means to be mature. In fact, it was used in Greek culture to describe the relationship between a teacher and their student. The student is supposed to grow and become more like their teacher, learn and become more like their teacher. So first of all, Jesus Christ is calling us to grow in him. That's clearly the message, to become more like him. Here's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that we can't ever make a mistake. 
It doesn't mean that if we're a carpenter, we can't ever build anything that has a blemish on it. It means that our attitude should be on doing whatever glorifies the Father, whatever we build, that it honor God. One time a sports announcer said Willie Mays was the perfect baseball player. Now when he said that, do you believe anyone in his audience understood him to mean that Willie Mays never struck out or never missed a fly ball or never got caught stealing second base or third base or home plate? Do you think that that he meant literally Willie Mays was perfect and never, ever made a mistake in baseball? Of course he didn't mean. We all know what he meant. He meant Willie Mays was a very good baseball player, a well-rounded baseball player. He could run and he could hit and he could steal and he could field very effectively. He served his position well for the position he was in. This verse doesn't mean, it doesn't demand sinlessness. Sinlessness. It demands that we understand our purpose and that we live up to our identity in Christ. It means that we strive to our very best ability to reflect the love of God into the world around us. Now the second key to understanding this verse is that it serves not only as a conclusion to this passage, but to all six of these examples that Jesus has been giving throughout Matthew chapter 5. It forces us to confess that we are indeed unable to live perfect lives. We are indeed unable to live up to the demands of the law. There's a third view. A third view of this verse. Notice what Jesus says. Key. You shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, there's an underlying message there that says, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect because that's why I came. Because of what I'm about to do for you. We're not perfect now, and we'll never be perfect on our own, But praise God, by the grace of God and Jesus Christ, we can be perfect just as our Father in heaven is perfect by and through the shed blood of the Lamb of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's an element in the Beatitudes that looks to the future. In fact, six of the nine Beatitudes look to the future. You shall be. Check them out. Six of the nine Beatitudes look to the future. So as Jesus closed this amazing chapter, he went back to this theme. He also went back to the theme of persecution because it's a real part of most Christians in most generations. Blessed are those who are persecuted for Christ's sake. This goes hand in hand with Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It goes hand in hand with Matthew 5, 20. Unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the, that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. When the law forces us to confess that we are nothing apart from the wonderful, the amazing, amazing grace of God, then it served its purpose. It can sit down. Because it points us to the truth that there is no hope for anyone except by the grace of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. God has called us to grow up. He's called us to maturity. He's called us to bring honor and glory to everything we do. And nothing makes that stand out better in our world than loving those 
who hate us. Colossians 3.23, And whatever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not to men. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this passage of Scripture closes this amazing, amazing chapter. Father, these words that you give us in this passage are difficult. In fact, impossible apart from your grace. So we pray, Lord, that we would just surrender, submit our will to yours and allow you to love the unlovable through us. And God, forgive us when we put our way ahead of your truth. For this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you're here today and you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, there has never been a time in your life when you've prayed to receive Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord. This invitation is for you. Maybe you're here today and and you're just not sure that if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven. You need to understand, God so loved you that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross in your place and in my place so that our sins could be forgiven and we could have a relation, a personal relationship with the creator of all that is created for all eternity. You come and receive that free gift. That's your invitation today. Or maybe you're a Christian Maybe you are a disciple of Christ. And to be very honest, you struggle with this passage, like so many of us do. Maybe right where you are, you just want to rededicate yourself to him and ask God to love others through you. There are folks that live all around us, work all around us, go to school all around us who need Jesus. And we can be a friend to them. We can love them. We can invite them to church. We can invite them to friend day in two weeks. It may be the greatest blessing that we could ever do for anyone else to simply invite them to church. So you come as the Lord calls. Would you come, Sherilyn, and lead us? Would you stand? Jesus is Lord of all. Mm-hmm.